We're also delighted that uh, we have Paul Krugman here to deliver the lectures this year. And Paul is, in fact, a repeat offender uh, in this series because he delivered them 21 years ago. Uh, but he tells me a couple of the slides are different. So <laughs> if, um, if anyone was here then, uh, it won't be uh, uh, complete repetition. And um, uh, the title is The Return of Depression economics, or the title for the series, and it so happens that there is a new version of his 1999 book, which is, he tells me, about 40% uh, new material, which is uh, available this evening. Uh, but, in fact, uh, the added incentive to buy the book is that what he's going to talk to us about is not primarily material from the book. Actually, it's uh, some thinking that is moving towards another monograph, uh, which will be out uh, in a little while. So uh, this is not uh, just reading out chapters from the book. Do not worry about that. Uh, there can be few people who are better placed to comment on the crisis and its implications for the economy and indeed for economics than Paul Krugman. As many of you know, he was awarded Nobel Prize in 2008. He teaches at Princeton, both uh, international affairs and economics, and of course, writes a very regular column in the New York Times, um, in which he occasionally used to comment on the Bush administration's policies, uh, if, I, uh, if I recall. Um, but he still, nonetheless, uh, finds a lot uh, to write about uh, in a publication um, which has had, of course, its own depression economics um, recently, though now rescued by Carlos Slim. Uh, I don't know if you're now paid in Mexican pesos, um, <laughs> but uh, actually that mightn't be such a bad deal compared to what's going on with the dollar. However, um, I'm going off in uh, entirely irrelevant directions here. You've heard enough from me, and we're delighted to welcome you to the school. Thanks. <laughs> Well, thanks, Howard. Um, thanks to all for coming. Thanks to the LSE for making the lecture possible. And, and thanks to the Robbins family. It is, uh, it, it almost makes me feel 21 years younger uh, to, to be here. Um, so, all right, I'm going to, uh, I'm going to be talking, obviously, about themes related to the crisis. And let me just tell you a bit about the plan for, for these three days. Um, um, all of them are, all, all three will be devoted to issues raised by this crisis. T today, I'm mostly going to be talking about what I call in the book depression economics, the, the very strange, almost Alice in Wonderland uh, uh, or Alice through the looking glass world in which we find ourselves, in which many of the normal rules of economics don't apply. And uh, uh, this will in some ways be material that's closest to things I've written about before, but. Uh, but I hope I'll have some important new things to say. Um, tomorrow's lecture um, is about the alpha and the omega of the crisis. So where did this come from and how the hell does it end, uh, which, are hopefully, which are clearly related questions. And so I'm going to be trying to talk about the, the, um, the prospects, uh, you know, how, what it was, the deeper sense in which, which led us to get into this crisis and, and the prospects for an end and, and what, what might take us out. Um, and uh, the third lecture, which I, it's a bad joke if, if people know, the, which I've, I've titled uh, The Night They Reread Minsky, um, is about the, um, the uh, really two longer term issues. One is the restructuring. What, what do we have to do? to our financial system in particular to make things like what has just happened less likely? And what do we need to do in terms of rethinking the way we do economics? Because so uh, economists, while I actually think are more useful in times like this than in any other circumstances, have actually, have, have obviously sort of not uh, covered themselves in glory in the course of the crisis. Um, so what I want to do today is, is talk about this strange world in which we now find ourselves and some of the difficulties that I think we, we have in, in coming to grips intellectually with the problems and, and, uh, and, the, uh, and what it is we can say at least about short-term policies to deal with the crisis. Um, this is, I think in a, in a very real sense, this is a, 
uh, a nightmare come true. Right? If you're, uh, if, certainly if you have any sense of economics, you know that the Great Depression of the 1930s was the, uh, uh, the, the worst event in terms of economics that, that uh, we've seen in modern times, perhaps the worst ever because while the terrible things happened in the past, they weren't really economic. Um, and uh, must, if you're at all uh, you know, serious about economics, must, uh, I think, every, certainly I have always had this you know, slight lurking fear that you know, it could happen again. Supposedly, we know enough about the economics to, to stop it. Supposedly, we learned the lessons of the last one, but did we really? Do we really have this thing under control? Um, constant lingering fear that something like the Great Depression might occur again. Um, so, something bad happened. Um, the, uh, the best tracking so far, the most revealing, has been work by Barry Eichengreen at, uh, uh, at Berkeley and Kevin O'Rourke, uh, fine economic historians who have also been uh, been uh, doing uh, some quantitative tracking. And what they've been telling us is that actually um, it is happening all over again, or at least the first year of the crisis uh, uh, has actually been fully comparable to the Great Depression. So this is showing uh, world industrial output uh, starting from the, the uh, you know, in, the, in the Great Depression, there's the blue line and the, the various things. They, they, they date the beginning of the global recession in April 2008. And world industrial output has fallen so far every bit as fast as it did in the Great Depression. So it is full repeat. And it's been a little, what, one of their points is that we, we tend, as you know, always, to look at the United States first. And for the United States, the pace of decline is uh, only about half as fast as it was in the Great Depression. But this time, the U.S. isn't at the, at the cutting edge of, of where things are going wrong. It's actually been falling faster elsewhere. Um, if you look at world trade, it's really stunning. The, the collapse in the volume of world trade that's been happening in this crisis is faster than it was in the Great Depression. I was raised as a student on all of these, uh, particularly Charles Kindleberger loved to show these diagrams that showed the, the shrinking spiral of world trade as this horrible uh, you know, the terrible things, and it was all things that would never, ever happen again. But at least the first year of the crisis has been every bit as bad and worse in terms of world trade, total collapse of, of world trade volumes, uh, which has had, just as a side remark, the, uh, the surprising result that some of the worst hit economies have been economies that did not seem to have a whole lot of financial excesses but simply were in the unfortunate position of being exporters of durable manufactured goods and got sideswiped by the slump. So Japan or Germany uh, didn't, didn't really have bubbles, not this time around, uh, but nonetheless uh, got hit very hard by the crisis. Now the main thing from an economist's point of view uh, about this other than, you know, oh my God, and, uh, and uh, what's happening to my, to my friends uh, in the financial world, what's happening to my friends in, in manufacturing, if you have, you know, uh, what, 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 what's happening uh, to my university's endowment um, the, um, has been that this was not supposed to happen. We were supposed to have this sort of thing under control. Um, and you can find quite a few statements to that effect. So this is, uh, I'm, I'm being a little unfair in singling him out, but this is, uh, was, it was a striking remark. Robert Lucas, Nobel laureate, great macroeconomist, one of the most influential of our time, uh, in his presidential address to the American Economic Association, said, well, you know, the central problem of depression prevention has been solved. And the, the point of his presidential address was to say, you know, let's stop worrying about this business cycle stuff. Uh, yes, there are business cycles, but they're not that big and doesn't matter that much and we should focus on long-term growth. That's basically what he was arguing. Um, so uh, there was a, a, you know, a view in the profession that, that this thing really was, was under control, that we didn't need to worry about it. And some people said some things uh, about our control over the economy that really sound stupid in retrospect. Um, so this is me in 1997. Uh, uh, well, you see, the, if you want a simple model for predicting the unemployment rate in the United States over the next few years, here it is. It will be what Greenspan wants it to be, plus or minus a random error reflecting the fact that he is not quite God. Um, now, why did I believe that? 
because I believed in the overwhelming effectiveness of monetary policy. I believed that uh, the, uh, whoever was in control of the money supply could always reflate demand. So if you had anything that looked like uh, the beginning of the Great Depression in the 1930s, uh, the Fed or the Bank of England or the European Central Bank could always just pump up the money supply and stop it from happening. Demand, manipulating demand was easy. The only problems uh, were, uh, well, we didn't have fine control. We couldn't fine tune the economy. You couldn't be sure, and of course you didn't have perfect uh, forecasting ability, so you know, Greenspan was not quite God, so that you might uh, get behind the curve. So for a year or so, things might spin you know, in a direction you didn't want it. There would be wiggles, and in fact, you shouldn't try to manage the economy too closely because you, you had imperfect control and, and lags and all of that. But basically, really big, really big falls in demand were not going to happen because we could always offset them. Uh, the central bank could always, uh, could always do what was necessary. Um, now, I actually changed my, my, my mind uh, just about a year after saying this, this particular dumb thing. Um, and the reason I changed my mind was, put it in one word, Japan. Um, the experience of Japan was a, uh, a very difficult one. Oh, sorry, one thing I meant to say before that. There was one reason why we thought that recessions might happen, uh, that nasty things might happen, that you could not resolve just by having the central bank be in charge, which was if you had a supply shock, if you had a sharp rise in the price of oil, something that was leading to inflation. You know, every textbook, uh, mine and Robin Wells' uh, included, says this is, this is tough. If you've got a supply shock, then you have a difficult choice between inflation and unemployment, and so that's a reason why you might have recessions, which is, in fact, what happened in the, in the worst recession until now, after after the 1930s, which was 1982. Um, but uh, what's happening right now is not a supply shock, just to say this. This is uh, US uh, Consumer Price Index annual rate of change. There was some rise there in the, in the uh, early part of the, what we now call the recession, uh, oil shock, uh, oil, oil price spike, food prices. But basically right now, uh, you know, we've had deflation over the past year. So this is not supply shock. This is a pure demand shock, and that's the sort of thing that we're supposed to be able to control. So, um, as I say, the, the reason that I began to have some skepticism about the, the possibility of demand shocks that we couldn't control, about something that looked at least qualitatively like the Great Depression happening all over again, was the case of Japan. Um, in the late 1980s, Japan had an enormous bubble in both stocks and in real estate. The bubble burst. The Japanese economy slipped into recession, had a weak recovery, had another recession, and most important, got into a situation where conventional monetary policy had been pushed to its limit, where the interest rate on short-term government debt was zero. Um, and nonetheless, the recession persisted. Nonetheless, the, uh, uh, Japan remained in a, in a slump. So um, this is just a rough picture. I could actually probably have chosen some even more, uh, uh, some cleaner numbers, but uh, interest rate is LIBOR, actually. Uh, the uh, short-term government debt was a bit lower than that. Um, inflation rate, CPI, GDP deflator is a little smoother. But anyway, basically, Japan, after, its, after the bubble burst, experienced steadily falling inflation, which eventually became deflation, cut interest rates repeatedly, eventually hitting zero, and remained depressed. Now, the blue line is real GDP per capita. It's a log scale. It's on the right-hand side. Um, it didn't actually have a plunge at any point. It was basically, after being a fast-growing economy up to the end of the 80s, Japan basically stagnated in terms of real per capita GDP with a few wiggles. Uh, that's the infamous lost decade in Japan. Um, one thing that I've been saying lately is that in light of you know, the, what we've been going through um, in all the world, including Japan, um, these last few months, actually Japan's lost decade is starting to look pretty good. 
Uh, there, was, there was no mass unemployment. There was no extreme plunge in the economy. Um, but it was certainly frustrating. This wasn't, I guess I can say, my first uh, 15 years as a professional economist were spent uh, uh, with everyone in the international economics field obsessed with Japan and Japan's success and uh, the Japanese threat or the Japanese example or whatever. Uh, we were all, and the Japanese were 10 feet tall, then they slid into a recession that basically never ended. And what was worse, it was unresponsive. They, they slipped into a, into a case of, uh, to an infection that was uh, resistant to the usual antibiotics. Um, that was a deeply alarming thing. Uh, not because it was so terrible. As I say, Japan in its lost decade was not, a, was not a terrible place to live. It was not mass unemployment. It was not uh, uh, blood in the streets, but it was intense, prolonged frustration over the inability to get that economy moving again. Um, and there were, I wasn't alone, obviously, in thinking about the Japanese example. I mean, some people looked at it and said, oh, this just proves that the Japanese are really messed up. Um, but uh, I, at least, uh, and a number of others looked at it and said, Japan, you know, basically looks lot, a lot like us. Advanced country, stable government, reasonably intelligent policymakers. If they can be caught in a trap like this, for an extended period, why can't it happen to, to, to other countries? Um, and um, so there were a number of people worrying about that. Um, there was, as it happens, a kind of a little nest of Japan warriors at Princeton in the early years of this decade. Uh, there was me, there was uh, Lars Svensson, who's now on leave at the Riksbank trying to save his economy. Um, and uh, third guy, what's his name? Bernanke, Ben Bernanke, don't know what happened to him. Um, in general, the Fed uh, was the Fed staff was quite worried about uh, about the, uh, the whole issue. And by the way, some of those Fed staff from the time are now at the ECB. So uh, so uh, uh, Athanasios Orfanidis was a, a big zero lower bound worrier uh, and is now uh, yelling at Triche to be more aggressive. But uh, but um, it was on people's mind as a possibility. And the thing is, it the uh, it came true. So this is. Uh, U.S. short-term interest rates, um, short-term interest rates on government debt uh, from, you know, from the immediate, to, from 1920 up to, to the present. Um, during the 1930s, uh, we spent an extended period of time with interest rates at about zero. Um, then we had a long period uh, when inflation was the big problem with the economy and interest rates were never anywhere near zero. We had a near Japan experience in the early years of this decade, after the 2001 recession, when, when rates were brought down to about 1% before the economy began to uh, a convincing recovery. Um, and a lot of people said, okay, coast is clear, we've avoided Japan type trap, but then we hit zero again. Now, I'm gonna talk much more um, tomorrow than I will today about what it was that triggered that slump but just uh, sort of the obvious things. We know that for reasons that uh, partly probably surely included financial deregulation, um, surely included the, uh, the glut of capital produced by, uh, by uh, surpluses in, in East Asia, the Middle East, and Germany. Um, and um, uh, probably also just a general uh, loss of carelessness that developed among borrowers and lenders because of an extended period without really serious recessions. We got into a situation of overextension, excessive leverage, and the, the mother of all housing bubbles in the United States, but also here and in Spain and in Ireland and, uh, and in Eastern Europe. And so we, when all of that burst, we, we plunged into a recession and it, the, the Fed's um, proposed, that the Fed had thought about how to deal with something like a Japanese trap. Uh, and one of their first rule was cut interest rates early and often, basically aggressive initial re po monetary policy response, which they did, um, but it wasn't enough. They went all the way to zero and the economy is still shrinking. And so it, it, they found themselves up against that zero lower bound, found themselves in the liquidity trap. Now. This is where we begin the Alice Through the Looking Glass uh, discussion. Um, 
a situation where short-term interest rates are zero, a situation where uh, the normal, you know, normally monetary policy is made by cutting a target interest rate, where you've gone all the way to the end of that. Um, that was named back in the 30s, the, the liquidity trap, the, uh, um, meaning that you can normally you increase the quantity of money. That means that people have more liquidity they want to, than, they, than they need. They lend it out. You get a, a sort of chain reaction through the credit markets that, that helps to expand the economy. But if interest rates are at zero, people are saturated. They're, they have as much liquidity as they want. They, there's, you know, they're not going to do more. Um, this was advanced. Really, it's, it's, it's a, not in those words, but it's advanced as a central theme in Keynes's general theory. Um, it was somewhat formalized by John Hicks in his famous 1937 paper, Mr. Keynes and the Classics, but it sort of vanished from consideration uh, in economics. You can actually sort of see why, just looking at this, right? A long period where interest rates were never anywhere near zero. Why would you think about it? Um, but when something like it arrived in Japan in the 90s, and now for all of us today, um, there was a lot of, a lot of people found it hard to believe. Certainly I did. There, there was a, a widespread belief that, well, look, you know, never mind those interest rates. It's got to, if, if, if the central bank prints a bunch of money, that has to have an expansionary effect on the economy. In fact, it has to be inflationary. There's no way. I mean, we just know that, right? Printing money is inflationary. You sometimes see people say, well, you know, if, if Zimbabwe can generate inflation, surely we can, right? Uh, that, that, uh, that printing money has to be uh, inflationary. And um, I actually shared that view myself. So when I was looking at Japan, you know, Japan was nagging at me for much of the 90s. And looking at the Japanese experience, I said, well, you know, they're just not trying hard enough. They just have to print more money. Uh, because if you print more money, it's, you know, never mind the, that interest rate, it'll just burn a hole in people's pockets. Something, it'll go somewhere. And to sh you say, well, we have this you know, standard way that we do short-term macroeconomics, the ISLM model, but everybody who does that knows that it's ad hoc, it's not really grounded in micro foundations, you know, all these things that economists say. And, uh, and presumably, if you thought about it really carefully and, and dotted all your I's and crossed all your T's, uh, you would come to the conclusion that, of course, expanding the money supply is effective no matter what. Um, what I did at the time, very economist thing to do was to build myself a little model to prove the point that I believed. And uh, so I built a little intertemporal optimizing, uh, whatever. Uh, and, um, um, and to my shock, and this is, this is the point, of course, of doing models, it actually gave me the opposite answer. It said, you know what? Liquidity trap can be real. It really can be true that, that printing money has no effect um, the reason, once you think about it, is pretty clear. Really, once you, for whatever reason, have gotten a situation where short-term interest rates are zero, well, then you go and do conventional monetary policy. What is conventional monetary policy? It is the central bank um, prints some money, or more accurately, credits banks with more reserves, and buys up a bunch of treasury bills, short-term government debt. If the interest rate is zero, what it's done is it's swapped one official asset with a zero interest rate for another official asset with a zero interest rate. Hasn't done anything. Doesn't, hasn't changed anybody's incentives. Hasn't really made any difference in, in the way people act. Uh, and uh, now you say well, that we, we know, a, a, you know a basic principle of, of economics is that doubling the money supply must in the long run double the price level, and neutrality of money. But it turns out, and this is what came clear from a simple model, is that that's not strictly speaking true. If you double today's money supply and double all expected future money supplies, you double the price level. But if you just do an ordinary monetary policy where people don't really think that you're going to expand the money supply forever, there's no reason at all why it has to be effectual. There really can be uh, a liquidity trap. Um, is that... Uh, Still, a lot of people say, well, this just can't be right. I've even seen uh, a number of people asserting, you know, it, uh, history shows that there are never any cases where people expand the money supply and it's not inflationary. Uh, but that just isn't true. Um, this is Japan. Um, monetary base 
Uh, I'm not sure if everybody here is, you know, uh, but the, as, as it, actually, side story. Um, Robin Wells, who's here, and I have an introductory um, economics textbook, and second edition is just out. And we spent much of, I think, November in second pass pages frantically redoing the money and banking chapter. Uh, now, the money and banking chapter is, is something that never changes, right? It's always the same, except all of a sudden, everything we'd said was no longer true, right? Everything that every textbook said was no longer true. So now, we're, we're the only uh, textbook uh, out there right, at the moment that doesn't lie about how money and banking works, because we, we caught up with events. Um, but um, so the monetary base is the sum of currency and circulation and bank reserves. And it's a single number, because those can move freely back and forth. Banks can take, uh, get, will issue currency out of their reserves and so on. Um, and the monetary base is what is literally under the control of the central bank. Monetary base only gets created through the actions of the central bank. Um, here's what the Japanese did. They, uh, once they really realized their problem was really serious, which was about 1997, um, they began increasing the monetary base a lot. They began buying lots and lots of Japanese short-term debt from Japanese banks crediting them with oops, increased reserves. Um, and um, by the way, that for those you know, following, that, that was the original meaning of quantitative easing, which has now come to be applied to a much more complex process, which is what the Bank of England and the Federal Reserve are doing now. And I'll get to that in a while. But the Japanese basically just pushed out the reserves out there, and more or less saying to the banks, you will take these extra reserves. Uh, here you are. Uh, and they very nearly doubled the monetary base and did nothing, no effect whatsoever. No, um, no inflation, no expansion of the economy, actually, just sat there. Uh, the banks piled up lots of reserves. Some of the cash made its way out to the public where it just sat there. Actually, I remember being told at the time by Japanese economists that there was only one consumer durable that was selling well in Japan at the time, which was safes. Um, really true. Honest liquidity trap. Well, the amount of money that they printed, or more accurately credited with the, to, uh, to bank reserves, made no difference at all, which is true in a, uh, in, in a, in a zero interest rate world. Um, go back to the Great Depression. Now, one of the reasons for our conviction that monetary policy has to work um, is that uh, the extremely influential work of, of Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz, who argued in their monetary history of the United States that the Great Depression uh, would not have happened if the Federal Reserve had, been, uh, had, had taken action to prevent a sharp fall in the money supply. That gradually, over the years, sort of morphed into the statement, the Federal Reserve caused the Great Depression. Uh, which wasn't quite what they said initially, but it's sort of how it came to be, uh, uh, came to be understood. And uh, famously, um, at a conference on, in honor of, of Milton Friedman's 90th birthday in, in 2002, Ben Bernanke uh, said to Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz, uh, on behalf of the Fed, uh, you're right, we did it, we're very sorry, but thanks to you, we won't do it again. So this is the, uh, um, what's funny, actually, a little bit, because I'm pretty sure that Ben Bernanke actually knew better at that point, uh, because he hadn't been thinking about the same issues, but, of course, you know, the courtesy of, uh, of talking to a genuinely great economist. Um, but if you actually look at what happened during the Great Depression, um, this is, um, it's a lot. Uh, just look for a moment at, at, uh, at monetary base and, and prices is a lot like Japan. It's, uh, in fact, uh, while there were, if you look at you know, month by month data, there were some wiggles and some, some mistakes made, particularly in 1931. Uh, uh, basically, the Federal Reserve of that era increased the monetary base enormously, increased it uh, by a huge amount uh, without uh, ever generating any inflation, in fact, without ever reversing the deflation that had taken place in the, in the first four years of the Depression. Um, why, did you ever, why did anybody ever get the notion that monetary policy was at fault here? Uh, well, Friedman and Schwartz focused not on base money, which is what the central bank controls directly, but on M2, which is a broad monetary aggregate, includes a, a wide variety of deposits, as well as currency and circulation. Um, 
Under normal circumstances, central bank can pretty well control M2 if it changes the monetary base. If it increases the monetary base, that will lead through the usual money multiplier process to, a, uh, uh, to an expansion in the broad money supply as well. Um, but the depression was not normal circumstances. Zero interest rate, uh, so that nothing was really, you know, uh, um, the put out base money had just sat there. Uh, M2 was really not under the Fed's control. Um, and uh, so if you see actually M2 does start to come up there at the end, but that's not because of something the Fed did, it's because the US economy was finally starting to expand. Largely, this is before we entered the war, but you had entered the war and we're getting, and we're buying a lot of stuff from us. So that's really what was happening at the end. Um, and so you know, there, there's, there's an endless, extremely bitter debate if you, if you dare to question the Friedman Schwartz version of things. And, and there is an argument that says that the Fed, if the Fed had not made some crucial missteps in 1930 and 31, they might have avoided the Great Depression. But I think the point is, once that was passed, was there anything that ordinary monetary policy could have done? And I think the, the evidence shows quite clearly no. That in fact, once you had hit, once you were in the liquidity trap, really didn't matter how much money you printed, didn't matter. Um, this is fairly terrifying because we have become, um, as a, uh, uh, our, our economic management has really become dependent upon central banks. We've, uh, we've shifted the burden of economic management very much onto technocrats at the Fed, the ECB, the, the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, who are supposed to manage the economy. Uh, there are lots of re good reasons to do that, but if they can't do it, strain, you know, this, then, then we've lost our, our principal and increasingly our only line of defense against, uh, against recessions. Uh, once you're in this world where there's no more that conventional monetary policy can do, then, then it's, a, it's a very strange place. A strange place which is actually not completely unknown territory to economists of a certain age. Because if you're old enough, you were taught sort of old-fashioned Keynesian economics, which pretty much discounted monetary policy and pretty much, uh, and did in effect sort of presume that there was something like a liquidity trap in effect. But uh, for generations further on uh, don't know this stuff. So in the discussion about economic policy that's been taking place right now, it's quite clear that many people, many economists, um, have in mind something like uh, this picture. Um, here, the interest rate is on the vertical axis. S and I are the supply of savings and the demand for savings, which I'm calling investment. Now, might, might or might not, uh, you know, that this is oversimplifying in multiple respects. Nothing in there about the distinction between short-term and long-term interest rates, nothing about other forms of capital you know, other, other financial markets, but, but just think of this. And this, is, this has got a model, this has got a name. It's, uh, it's the loanable funds model of the interest rate. And it is the way, you know, it's, well, it's, it's, it's right there in Krugman and Wells. So we must, you know, we, we, we do do that. It's a, it is basic, your normal way of thinking about how interest rates work, supply and demand. Um, but it's not quite right, right? We know that, um, uh, we know it's not quite right because savings and the supply of savings and the demand for investment both do depend, among other things, on the, the level of output in the economy. If GDP goes up, uh, that's going to shift both those curves. Um, and um, actually, there's, I think there's just, no, there are two diagrams, I think, in, in Keynes's general theory, maybe three. But anyway, one of them is a very, very hard to read uh, version of what I'm about to show you, but, but uh, what I'm about to show you is actually, it's, it's in Hicks, Keynes and the Classics, um, saying, well, you know, suppose you can draw these curves as, as they are here as, as a, uh, for a given level of GDP, but suppose GDP rises. Some of the increase in GDP will be saved. On the other hand, the increase in GDP would probably increase the amount people want to invest. Do something like this. Uh, GDP increases, people want to save more at any given interest rate, people will want to invest more. Suppose life gets a 
more complicated if this isn't true, but suppose that, that the increase in savings is more than the increase in investment at a given interest rate, then, then what happens is that at a higher level of GDP, uh, the, uh, the interest rate that is determined by, uh, by um, the intersection of the supply and demand for lending uh, falls. Higher, higher level of GDP means lower interest rate. And this is one way of deriving in fact, it's the way that, that Hicks derived what everybody who's taken intro-macro calls the, the IS curve, right? This is a, there's actually different levels of the interest rate uh, associated with any given level of GDP. Now, we usually think about it the other way around. We think about it as, uh, um, well, if you cut the interest rate, then investment will rise, and that will lead to a rise in income, which leads to a rise in consumption, and there's a multiplier process. That's actually equivalent. It's just a different way of thinking about the same thing. It's actually it's just a different, a different way of thinking about the same model, actually. But we think that there is um, some relationship between the interest rate and the level of demand in the economy. Um, if you're in a liquidity trap, what's happened is that you've reached a point where the interest rate that you would have to have to have full employment is unfortunately negative, which you can't actually do, of course. Uh, if you, can, you can actually, we've actually have had brief interludes where for, uh, you know, for a, a few hours, the uh, interest rate on, on US Treasury bills has been slightly below zero, owing to technicalities about, uh, about the use of T-bills as collateral and so on. But, the, uh, but basically, uh, if, if interest rates uh, try to go below zero, people will just accumulate cash instead. So, so zero is a lower bound on the interest rate. And this is, this is unmistakably where we are right now. We really are at, at, at full employment. Uh, sorry, we really are at a situation where the interest rate, boy, that's a few phrases got, got, got elided there. Yes, yeah, so we are at a situation, this is the, one of those things that you, that bad newspaper columnists do. You take a quote from somebody, and by having enough ellipses in there, you can make them say anything you want. Um, no, we're, we're, we're at a situation where the interest rate that would be required to have uh, full employment is clearly negative. Um, the Fed, uh, they don't quite do this calculation. They instead ask what the Taylor rule, which is a, a rule of thumb for setting the federal funds rate says. And what the Taylor rule says is that given the Fed's own forecasts, by the end of this year, the Fed, Fed funds rate should be minus 5%. Uh, Goldman Sachs, with slightly different forecasts and slightly different version of the rule, says minus 8. But anyway, it's no, no question that if there wasn't this awkward problem that you can't put interest rates below zero, they'd be a lot lower than they are right now, and we'd need that. Um, another way of, of saying that is to ask what the supply and demand for lending would look like if the world were at full employment. Uh, and the answer clearly is it would look like this. Um, the amount that the world would like to save uh, if, the, if, it were, if we were at full employment is more than the amount that the world is willing to invest if we were at full employment. Um, there's a fundamental sense in which what's going on in today's world is that there is too much desired saving, chasing too little willingness to invest. Um, and what happens, of course, is not that there are these excess savings that that disappear into the ether, what happens is that the world economy contracts, that the world is depressed enough so that uh, people's reduced income reduces their saving enough to bring it into line with the amounts that people are willing to invest. The, um, this brings you into the world of a really kind of paradoxical world. It's a world where virtue is vice, and, uh, and prudence is folly. Um, the best known piece of that is the famous, or used to be famous, I'm not sure if anybody under 50 has heard about it, the, the, the paradox of thrift. Um, in this kind of world, if I decide to save more, uh, or rather if everybody decides to save more, if everyone becomes uh, anxious to save more than they were saving before, they don't actually su succeed in doing that because no one's willing to invest those extra savings. Instead, the economy shrinks. Uh, and in fact, if investment falls in the face of a weaker economy, since for the economy as a whole, savings equals investment, um, if everyone tries to save more, they actually end up saving less. 
And we are definitely in that world right now. Um, if you look at investment right now, business investment has fallen sharply despite the fall in interest rates. And it's fallen primarily because there's a lot of excess capacity in the economy. Why build new factories and new shopping malls if the, you can't use the ones you have? There's a little bit of financial disruption in there as well, but basically we're clearly in a world where the efforts of everybody to save more are leading to less investment and therefore to less saving. Paradox of thrift world. Um, that's, a, you know, that's a difficult concept to wrap your mind around, uh, but, but we're there. The, the reason that the paradox of thrift sort of disappeared as a topic in economics for a long time was that we always assumed that Uncle Alan uh, or Uncle Mervyn uh, would cut interest rates so as to turn those desired savings into actual investment, that you would, would, uh, would cut interest rates, lead to higher investment demand, that would find a, a way to use those savings. But if you can't cut interest rates, then we really are in paradox of thrift world. Um, not only private individuals who save or dissave, of course, uh, governments can do it. And hence, we're in the world where expansionary fiscal policy, where increasing government spending without raising additional revenues is in fact expansionary, it does in fact help the economy expand. Um, it's been, I don't wanna to go too far into this line, but it's been pretty shocking and, uh, and depressing uh, to discover how few people sort of understand that point, uh, including lots of um, eminent economists who just haven't thought about this. So there have been a whole series of, of people declaring, well, I don't see how government deficit spending can actually do you any good because after all, savings equals investment, and so if the government uh, engages in more spending that reduces savings, so investment must fall. Completely missing the point, of course, that savings is endogenous. Um, and many, many declarations, uh, including uh, uh, some, some uh, whining in the Financial Times that, well, there must be uh, you know, a lot of borrowing, uh, must, must drive up interest rates. Uh, because how can it not be so? If there's more borrowing, there's more demand for funds, and so interest rates must go up. And of course, what's happening is people are thinking that. Uh, they're missing the point that those curves you know, move uh, if the economy expands or contracts, so that it's not, it, those are not fixed in place. Um, we are, in fact, very much in a world in which uh, government deficits do not crowd out investment. In fact, they probably crowd in investment. Uh, because, uh, because the economy is depressed, because there is an excess of desired saving. And if you give some of those savings a place to go um, by selling government debt and using it to spend, then you are in fact having an expansionary impact on the economy. Now, uh, that's, a, that's kind of a logical argument. And you might say, well, gee, that's, you know, that, that's all very well, but I just don't believe it. Um, terrific chart. Um, Actually, a pair of charts. Let, let me first give you the, uh, the, the, the picture. The U.S. is, of course, engaging in, uh, in very large deficits right now, U.K. as well, but uh, I I'm, can more easily use the U.S. data, and, and it's, a, it's sort of more, that's a bigger player anyway, so let's, let's just use the U.S. So this is actually uh, U.S. net federal borrowing at an annual rate. Um, Looks even worse if you, if you lose, use the uh, projections, but I thought, I've actually decided I really prefer so far as possible to, give, given how, how much the world has defied everybody's predictions, I prefer to actually use the num real numbers. So this is what we actually have up through first quarter of 2009. An annual rate, the U.S. has gone from, you know, what we thought was a serious deficit, and even in 2007, up to a uh, uh, deficit at well over a trillion dollar annual rate. And people say, well, you know, never mind, you've, you've given me a bunch of funny pictures. Where on earth could the money possibly come from to finance that? Why will the Chinese be willing to lend us all that money? Well, terrific picture, as I said, from, uh, from Brad Setzer, the Council on Foreign Relations, who took the U.S. flow of funds accounts and just calculated private and public borrowing in the United States as a share of GDP. Uh, the uh, darker line at the top is borrowing by households and firms, and the uh, green line at the bottom is borrowing by the government. And uh, look, at, look at what happened there. The, yes, the government is borrowing an incredible amount, 
um, all of a sudden, but private sector has actually swung from huge borrowing to net repayment in this crisis. Uh, collapse of business investment, collapse of housing investment, consumers who in the United States had not been saving at all two years ago, now going up to something approaching historic rates of saving. Uh, where is the money coming from? It's coming from the private sector. If you look, actually, the fall in the private borrowing is greater than the rise in the public borrowing. We're actually pulling in less money from overseas than before. We're, uh, we're actually importing less capital from China. Uh, the question of who's going to pay for it, the answer is us. Um, and it's worth saying um, that uh, we are in better shape. If, if the government were not doing all that borrowing, then you'd have more saving without a place to go, which would mean a, a deeper contraction in the economy, and less investment. So in fact, uh, all that government borrowing is actually not only helping sustain us in the present, it is helping sustain us where us means the consolidated economy, the consolidated balance sheet of the public and private sector. It's actually making us richer in future, or less poor, reducing the extent to which we're impoverishing ourselves in future. Uh, this government borrowing is productive. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't a problem, because in fact, we don't have a consolidated balance sheet. And there is a question whether the government will in fact be able to collect the revenue it needs to service the debt it raises from, from that. And, um, I think those worries are exaggerated, but they're real, and I'll talk about that in the second lecture. But, uh, but it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a, uh, a, uh, uh, a benefit from, from the point of view of, of, of our society. Better to be doing this borrowing than not, because the private sector ain't borrowing, and, and, uh, and somebody has to make use of that saving. Um, isn't this still driving up interest rates? Um, well, there is a complication which has provided a lot of fuel for a for, uh, combination of angst and, and finger pointing, which is that there is no the interest rate. There's a term structure. Uh, what's literally zero, of course, is the short term interest rate. Even that isn't literally zero, it's about 0.12 or 0.13 lately. Um, what's, but that's you know, um, if we're looking at something like 10-year bonds, then that's, a, to a first approximation, reflects expectations of short-term interest rates over a 10-year period. And even if we're deep in a liquidity trap now, which we are, um, we might not be. Uh, we hope we won't be uh, 10 years from now, although, as I'll explain in tomorrow's lecture, I really am concerned about that. But uh, um, the, uh, and, and therefore, you would expect long-term interest rates to be higher. And long-term interest rates can go up or down, depending upon what people think might happen in some future when we're not in liquidity trap. Um, what's actually happened to interest rates? Um, this is, in some ways, I think, the, the most uh, or the first thing you want to look at, which is um, we have uh, in the United States, I guess here as well, uh, we now have indexed uh, bonds, which, which do allow us to, you know, the payment is, is adjusted for future changes in the consumer price index, which allows us to um, uh, look directly at what the real interest rate is. Um, and in the United States, uh, real interest rates fell very low in the early stages of the recession because people were basically discounting the possibility that this might be Great Depression too. Um, that surge there is not really, uh, that, that's, that's misleading because this is a less liquid market than, uh, than, than regular old treasury bills. And so uh, the, the liquidity problems that were causing you know, the prices of, of anything that wasn't a treasury bill uh, skyrocketed there for a while after the fall of Lehman. And so you've got what looked like high real interest rates, but it's probably just a liquidity issue. And now, um, all right, well, you know, the, the much talked about rise in, in interest rates because of this vast government borrowing is that little wiggle up there at the end. Uh, and it's, uh, well, there's something there. Uh, but it's worth noting that real interest rates are not high by historic standards. Uh, they're not high by any absolute standard. Uh, whatever's going on there, it's, it's nothing to say that, that there's a tremendous problem of financing these government deficits doesn't show there. If you look at the nominal interest rates, uh, 
it's more striking. Um, but that's, if you look, the implied inflation rate there is around, at this point, is about 1.8%, uh, the difference between the indexed and the, which, um, you know, the Fed's target is 2%. Uh, so what this is really telling you, this rise is telling you that, that, uh, that people thought that we might be sliding into a Japanese type deflationary spiral. And now they've really reduced their weight on that possibility. I think they're too optimistic. But anyway, it's not, this is not what you call bad news. So just to, to say, if, uh, I think the real picture to really make the point is this one still. That, that yes, there's an enormous rise in government borrowing, which is, and, and thank heavens there is because we've had a spectacular collapse in private borrowing. Now, we do have a long-term budget issue, which I'll talk about, but this is, this is the story about what's happening now. Um, we've had something else taking place, um, which is monetary policy in its conventional form is completely at a loss. P buying treasury bills accomplishes nothing. Um, what do you do in that case? Um, one possibility is you throw up your hands, uh, which is what the Japanese did for a lot of the 90s. Another is that you do what the Japanese called quantitative easing, which is you buy lots and lots of government debt and give the banks huge reserves and sort of just hope that they're going to do something with them. Uh, another, you might try to actually do something about try to change expectations, which they haven't really tried to do very much. Um, but one more thing, which is what Ben Bernanke actually thought about quite a lot in advance of, of this, uh, eh, there we go, uh, in advance of, of this crisis, was that you're going to have the central bank do other stuff. You have to have the central bank buy other assets. It doesn't have to be just uh, short-term treasury bills. Now, there's a reason why you focus on short-term treasury bills, because there is basically no risk. Uh, start to buy other stuff, there is a risk. But so um, in a series of papers between uh, 2002 and 2004, Ben Bernanke and Vince Reinhardt uh, talked about policies, talked about changing the composition of the central bank's balance sheet as a, as a way of trying to get some traction even with a zero interest rate. So they were actually on this topic. And they did, they made a case that it would do so, that it would be effective. I think they never imagined that, the, what, that they'd actually be putting into practice, or at least not on this scale. So here's one of my favorite pictures. It, it shows the, uh, the Fed's assets. Um, the blue stuff at the bottom is treasury bills. And once upon a time, not very long ago, uh, that was all that the Fed owned. Uh, since then, wow, uh, expansion, this huge, uh, alphabet soup of stuff. Um, agency, that's Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. Um, Maiden, that's, that's uh, Maiden Lane LLC, that's, uh, that's Bear Stearns. Uh, MBS is mortgage-backed securities. Uh, AIG, you know what that is. Uh, um, incredible. Uh, tripling of the size of the Fed's balance sheet, doubling of the monetary base along the way, although that's probably the least of it. Um, and a lot of people look at that and say, oh my God, that's terribly inflationary. But again, we're in liquidity trap territory. The increase in the monetary base by itself means nothing. Um, I actually, the way I actually look at it is that the following. What's most of this expansion of the monetary base has taken the form of large, huge excess reserves that commercial banks are holding at the Fed. Um, those, commer those reserves are now paying some interest. So basically, banks are taking a lot of money. They, there's actually been, you know, people have rushed to deposit their money in banks because it's guaranteed. The banks are basically taking those deposits and parking them in a safe place at the Fed. And then the Fed is lending it out with all of these programs. And that's not really printing money. It's really the Fed serving as financial intermediary of last resort. Uh, it's the Fed basically doing the lending that the private banks are unwilling to do. Um, that's not, it's not at all conventional money printing. Um, it's a little alarming. You really don't want, in the long run, you really don't want the central bank to be so involved in the, in the business of lending. Um, but it's arguably necessary. 
Um, it's, uh, I mean, it, there is a question, where does it stop? Uh, Robin uh, Wells, my, my co-author and wife, has suggested that within a year or so, we're all going to have Visa cards with the Fed logo on them. But uh, the, um, but the, uh, but it, it, it's, it's something that, that seemed like a good thing. Uh, I have to say, all this was presaged. If you've been reading the collected works of Ben Bernanke, uh, you would have seen this coming, right? In some ways, uh, U.S. monetary policy is just marching down Ben's CV. Uh, we tried his 2002 paper. Okay, that wasn't enough. We tried his 2003 paper. But, um, um, you know, and it, it has, I think, um, helped. Uh, a lot of the spreads in the markets have come down. Some of the really acute financial stuff seems to have, um, uh, ha have come to a halt. Um, what has not happened, uh, oh, sorry, one more thing to say about, uh, you know, isn't this you know, hugely inflationary, whatever. Um, and the answer is, uh, basically, it's not expanding, not doing much to expand the money supply as opposed to the monetary base. Just uh, part of our, our rewriting of everything in the money and banking chapter, you all know about the money multiplier. Maybe not all, but everybody who's uh, taken economics, you know, the, the uh, uh, you, central bank prints a dollar, it sits in the, in, in the bank, the bank lends out 90% of it, that money is deposited in another bank, which then lends it out, and so on and so on. Um, so the money multiplier, now the money multiplier is always smaller than people think it is, because the fact of the matter is that most monetary base is held in the form of cash, uh, which doesn't have that multiplier effect. But still, U.S. M1 money multiplier is now less than one. The banks are actually just sitting on so much excess reserves that all of this increase in the Fed stuff has basically not gone to increase the money supply. We have a money multiplier that's now below one. Awesome change. Everything, everything you were taught in, in money and banking is now no longer true. Um, what we've done, actual policy measures, we've had this acceptance of huge budget deficits which is different from what happened in the Great Depression when governments, at least initially, um, raised taxes and cut spending and attempt to balance their budgets. Uh, we've had this expansionary monetary policy, which is uh, um, there, was, there were fewer wiggles along the way than there were, you know, 1931, the year of infamy, was when many central banks actually raised discount rates in an attempt to defend the gold standard. Uh, we've had this unconventional monetary policy um, we've had government step in to rescue financial institutions. Uh, all of that, cross your fingers, knock on wood, whatever, we do not, despite those horrifying Eichen Green, O'Rourke numbers, we don't seem to actually, we seem to be sort of kind of stabilizing. I don't know if this was the best. There, there are many such indicators. This is a high frequency business conditions index that's just different from the ones you usually see. Um, it's, it's basically a diffusion index, uh, which means that zero is roughly the economy expanding a trend. So the fact that it's still well below zero is telling you that things are still getting worse. It's obvious. You know, the unemployment rate in the United States has just hit 9.4%. I never imagined that was going to happen again in my lifetime. Um, but things seem to be getting worse more slowly. There is some reason to think that we're, we're stabilizing. I would not be surprised if the, uh, if the official end of the U.S. recession ends up being, uh, in retrospect, dated sometime this summer. Um, by the way, the, the U.S. definition of a recession is it's a recession if the recession dating committee says it's a recession. Uh, but, but broadly speaking, uh, they tend to look at things like industrial production. If, as soon as something turns up, as soon as some major measure turns up, like industrial production, they'll declare the that the recession ended then. But, um, but almost surely, unemployment will keep rising for a long time. And there's a lot of reason to think that this is going to go, that the, that the world economy is going to stay depressed for an extended period. Uh, in fact, as I said at the beginning, uh, early on, the, the Japanese uh, lost decade is actually starting to look good in terms of depth right now. It was not nearly as deep as what we're going through. I actually am actually worried it might start to look good in terms of duration as well. Uh, that is, that this thing could easily go on uh, for a very, very long time. In fact, it's quite hard to talk about how it ends. But all of that's for the next lecture. Thanks. Go back to my, just love that picture. 
All right. Thank you. Well, this is a, a real uh, cliffhanger, and you sure know how to get a good audience for the following night. That's right. Um, Perils of Pauline. Uh, yep. Um, uh, but, you know, it's much better than Britney Spears, who does the same show every night uh, at the O2. So uh, she can learn from you in terms of uh, building audience. Um, well, I'm going to throw it open to, to questions now. I'd be grateful if you could put your hand up, and a microphone will come to you and say who you are. If you're obviously from the Treasury or the bank, we'll grant you anonymity. Um, but uh, yeah, down here. So let's wait, wait for a question. Wait for the microphone, sorry. Hi, this is Alan Taylor from uh, UC Davis. I'm visiting LSC. Thank you, Paul. Um, I'm going to ask you a historical question, but also uh, ask for some contemporary uh, reflection, too. So the Icon Green O'Rourke discussion and the, the, the Kindleburger cobweb story. We look back to the, uh, to the Great Depression and we see scary declines in trade and now it's happening all over again. So two questions. First, um, is that just like a side effect? We shouldn't worry about it or should we look at that precipitous decline and say, well, there could be uh, second round effects and other stuff coming back to bite us uh, in the near future? How do we think about causality there? And then again on causality, if we look back to the 20s and 30s and we want to explain why world trade decline. There are uh, many usual suspects, uh, collapse of the gold standard, rising protectionism, uh, increasing uh, real trade costs. Nowadays, we don't have uh, a collapsing gold standard. There isn't any rising protectionism yet, and uh, the Baltic dry goods index has uh, fallen off a cliff, and there are lots of you know transport ships uh, sitting off Singapore. So uh, do you even ha have a story about why it's happening? OK. Um yeah, I was actually somewhat afraid someone was going to ask me that. So, uh, um, so what Alan's saying is, is we've had this spectacular collapse in world trade, and it is, it is funny because, uh, as, as I yeah, we, we were brought up with the the Kindleberger spiderweb diagram showing monthly trade figures collapsing, and and that was taken. It's often taken to be a demonstration of that that Smoot Hawley did it. Uh, and which was never, never made sense. That was always a noble lie, right? Uh, don't, don't, don't be protectionist because you'll have another Great Depression. Um, uh, plenty of good reasons not to be protectionist, but that's not one of them. Um, but now we've just seen you know, the, de the, the real world demonstration that you, without any major protectionist move, without any of the obvious suspects, this thing has been accompanied by a huge collapse in, in the volume of trade. Um, I don't have a full explanation. It has surpassed anybody's expectation of how fast trade would decline. It's sort of off the charts from the normal relationship. As best we can tell, there are a few things that, that are going on. One is trade credit. So, and I don't know really how hard to push this, but we do know that the disruption of financial markets see, caused a lot of problems for trade credit. Uh, another is that this, uh, um, the, more of world trade probably consists of durable manufactured goods than was the case uh, um, 75 years ago, which means that the um, that and that's what that's what people cancel their purchases of uh, when you have a slump like this, and they and also there are actual inventories of traded goods. So to some extent, trade volumes collapsed dramatically because stuff was sitting in the docks at, in, in Oakland or in Elizabeth, New Jersey, and why why send more? Um, and some of this, there's been some bounce back in the last month or two uh, as as some of those inventories get drawn down. Uh, but and then there's there's a lot of people have been suspecting that something about the extreme vertical disintegration of trade, the fact that, you know, you're, that you know, where, where is an iPod made? You know, and the last stop is China, but if you actually try to figure out where it's made, it's made in a dozen countries, and, and uh, um, that that may somehow contribute, although it's not totally obvious on the arithmetic why that should work, but maybe it interacts with the inventory stuff. But yeah, in the end, I don't think it's, I don't think it deepens the, I don't think it's an independent story for contraction. Uh, I, I can't really see that in, in, in the story. It, it does have this effect that, that, the, uh, that, um, that the countries suffering the worst punishment are not the ones that had the worst financial excesses, that, that you have, and not just countries, but regions. So you, uh, globally, the, the deepest slumps among the major advanced countries seem to be coming in Japan and Germany, which did not have bubbles. And within the United States, the worst hit 
uh, metropolitan area is Detroit, which certainly never had a housing bubble. So uh, that's a, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's, it is awesome. I mean, it, I would never, that, that trade chart just is, is, you know, it's the one we use to say, look how bad this is, but there is something funny about how, just how bad it is for trade. Um, who's next? Yeah, one right up the, the back there, yeah. Priyanka Malhotra, JP Morgan, European Credit Strategy. So one of the things that is disturbing me at the moment is the change in rhetoric I see um, since this, the current rally started um, from whether it's Bernanke or, or a few other leading economists that you know, the financial markets are lending support to the economic outlook. Um, I'm fairly young and I would hope they would know that financial markets are fickle and one or two negative data points and they're going to collapse. And really, I'm not sure I see banks lending. I'm not sure I see um, investors really buying assets. To me, it's, if you look at what's rallied, it's the worst performing names, which are fundamentally actually um, problematic that are rallying. So it's a yeah. traditional short covering rally. You know, the, the equity market, you have one failed rights issue. Companies won't, will no longer be able to raise finance. So you've got all these problems taking place. How do you see, you know, this change in rhetoric, or why is it, what is it that I don't understand about central bankers taking comfort in the fact that the financial markets are, are rallying and hence lending support? Yeah, um, you know, part of it is that they themselves believe that, you know, confidence is a, is a variable in itself and, and would like to, to egg it on. Partly it's that central bankers, uh, you know, do hang out with financial industry. Uh, if if, if uh, the people there that they, uh, that they see all the time are, are feeling good, it probably communicates itself to them. Um, and, and skepticism, you know, it, there's a lot of real data there show, that's showing the pace of decline slowing, but not anything actually adding up. Um, but, uh, um, but it is always hard. I mean, it's really, there ha was this tendency to, you know, when Tim Geithner made his first bank rescue speech, people, it was treated as a great failure because the stock market went down, as if the stock market actually knows anything. And now the, the late, now he's treated as a, as a great hero because the stock market went up, again, as if the market knows anything. Um, at Nouriel Roubini updated the old Samuelson line. He said that so far uh, in, this, uh, in this crisis, the stock market has predicted six of the last zero recoveries. Um, um, I guess I'll make one observation that's a little bit snarky, but um, Ben Bernanke surprisingly turns out to be, uh, he's actually a, a, uh, a, a great phrase maker. He's, he's historically had a whole series of phrases that he either invented or popularized. Um, the, uh, the great moderation, uh, global savings glut, um, and now green shoots. And it turns out, unfortunately, that, that in the past, at least pretty consistently, the things he described you know, turned out to be, it, the, the global savings glut was originally saying it's fine. You know, the, America is a good place to take this money because we have such sophisticated, sound financial markets. And the, uh, the great moderation was saying, well, us central bankers have got this thing licked. And uh, I'm afraid that the green shoots might turn out to be another one of those. That's a good argument um, for moving the Fed to Detroit. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, there, there is a, there, you know, that's a, the, the, well, okay, the socialization, the, the fact of, uh, it, it is very, it, this is a broader problem, of course, that we've been saying that, that um, in, in general, in making policy right now, you do need to have key officials who do know where the bodies are buried, but it's almost impossible in that case to find key officials who weren't also personally involved in putting them there. <laughs> well, here we've got the solution, which is we keep the treasury at one end of town and the bank at the other, and we dig up every road in between, That's which right. is what we've been doing. Um, who's next? Yeah, right at the um, back there. there. Yeah, got you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Kevin from the Department of Management. Uh, you just went, uh, Mr. Krugman, you just went to China, and uh, it seems that uh, many people believe that the Chinese exported too much to the world. So uh, beside, uh, for the Chinese government, besides investing in uh, infrastructure and uh, social security programs, what else uh, can the Chinese government do to boost domestic uh, demand? Well, those are the Thank two you. things I would have mentioned, uh, that the Chinese can, uh, uh, social insurance, uh, you know, health care, they're 
supposedly moving on that, and that they really need to. I mean, it, it, I, I've I've read I think most of the of the literature on uh, on why did the Chinese save so much, and you can basically find papers to support any point of view might, you might want to choose to have. But, but it does seem plausible that the absence of a social safety net is, is, is important. That, uh, that what people kept on telling me there was that, uh, that in China, you, you, you stop at the bank on the way to the emergency room uh, right. because the hospital will demand cash. Uh, and that's got to be one factor. But yeah, um, infrastructure, um, health care, Probably a retirement system, uh, which I don't think is 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 in the cards yet. But uh, and while they work on domestic demand, there there is, uh, you know, we do have a problem, which is that um, China has uh, uh, China is a capital exporter, not in the way that Japan is a capital exporter because of market decisions, but because the the government uh, through the the government basically takes a whole bunch of capital and exports it itself. And, and that, is a, uh, that is a destabilizing factor in the world economy, especially right now in the situation where there's a global excess of savings. Uh, the Chinese, by lending lots of money abroad, are not actually doing anybody else any good. They're, they're just doing harm. And it's, it is going to be a real problem uh, if it isn't resolved in the not too distant future. Yeah, take a uh, thanks. Hi, James Ferguson, um, strategist at Pally International. Uh, Professor Krugman, you didn't really mention the banks too much, and at the yeah. risk of uh, digging into next or tomorrow's lecture, yeah. uh, to what extent do you think that the solution to a liquidity trap is uh, recapitalization of the banks? Okay, that is stuff I'm going to talk about some more uh, tomorrow. I, I, I will say that it's, it's an article of faith uh, that the, the Japanese problem was essentially about the weakness of the banks. and. Uh, um, but it's, it's not that well supported by the evidence. It has to be some factor. The weakness of, of banks, the weakness of private lending markets has to play some role. But it's, it's, it, let's put it this way. I would be very nervous. I, I'm in favor of aggressive action to recapitalize the banks, more, more so than, than, than my government is willing to do at the moment. So, uh, uh, but but uh, I think it would be really wrong to, to assume that that will solve the problem. Um, actually, let me enlarge on that a bit. It, it is stuff we'll be talking about some tomorrow. But um, if you look at the fall in demand, you say, you know, how much of that do we need to invoke the troubles of the banks to explain? We don't need the troubles of the banks to explain why the U.S. consumer savings rate, which used to be 9%, uh, has, has recently gone up from 0 to 5.7 the housing bust, the destruction of wealth, the realization that your, the rising value of your house will not provide for your retirement is enough to explain that. Uh, we don't need the problems of the banks to explain the housing bust itself. We had crazy prices, not as crazy as yours, but crazy, um, and, uh, and, and overbuilding, so we had the housing bust. Uh, difficulty of, borrow, of business borrowing must surely have been a factor, but probably most of the decline in, in business investment is because we have all this excess capacity, thanks to the housing bust and the decline in consumer demand. So when you put it all together, you come up with a story about the slump when, in which the financial constraints due to the weakness of the banks are probably a factor, but certainly not the majority factor, which means that fixing those constraints is not going to bring you back to recovery. I'm going to take one more here, and then we ought to. Yeah. William Wallace, um, I used to teach at the LSE. Um, I want to ask uh, you to expand a little more on what you were hinting at in terms of the implications for the teaching of economics. Okay. Uh, I, I had a, a, a good friend from Washington, from the Beetson Institute, staying with me a while ago, and I asked him, how much do you think people are going to change the way they teach economics in the major American universities next year? And he said, not a bit. Now, you're suggesting that you're changing the way you teach it a little bit. Um, tell me what you think, what's happened, and how unexpected so much of it was, tells us about how much we do need to reconsider the conventional wisdom of the economic discipline. All right, that is about half of the third lecture, so. Uh, <laughs> but just, just to say, um, sort of quickly, um, that uh, 
in macroeconomics, certainly at the, at the graduate level, uh, um, we were, I'd say the graduate schools were divided between those that devoted uh, most of their time to teaching models in which this sort of thing could not happen, um, and departments that spent all of their time devoted to teaching models in which this sort of thing could not happen. Uh, and, and while, and there, there is an older tradition uh, that obviously needs, you know, it, it's not, I cer we certainly don't want to read Keynes or Minsky as, uh, as holy text. Uh, actually, you probably don't want to read Minsky at all. Uh, he's a terrible writer, but uh, though great, a uh, lot of economic insight. But, um, but we certainly need to recapture. There was an older tradition that got driven out by the demand for rigor, by the demand for micro foundations, and really, uh, we lost clearly. We lost sight of of, of the the real risks that are in the economy. So, uh, um, I don't think. Uh, well, a lot, lots more to say about that, but clearly, we, we we did we did get pretty far off the wrong track. Uh, far along the wrong track in terms of the way that, that macroeconomics has been taught in, in much of the profession. Well, there, there will be extra spare tickets available now for the third lecture because uh, clearly none of our economics department will be coming to Right. That. So uh, <laughs> uh, you can apply for their returns. Um, thank you very much for a fantastic uh, start. Paul's kindly agreed to sign books that are outside. If people want to, he'll going to stay up here. Uh, but we uh, are very much looking forward to uh, uh, Krugman 2 and Krugman 3, uh, but thanks for tonight. Okay, right. thanks a lot.